Hello and welcome to the third video in our ASAP debate series. This video is going to be about how to form a complete argument. In debate, usually for each resolution, you'll have multiple arguments. We will often call each argument a contention. Now, I want you to think about the arguments that you've had in your life. How many times have you made what you thought was a perfect argument? Everything that you had laid out was perfectly clear. Your reasons made perfect sense to you. And yet, the person on the other side just didn't seem to get it. It wasn't enough for them. What probably happened there is that your argument might have had some good ideas, but it wasn't complete. It didn't go all the way from point A to point B to point C so that it could actually not only convince someone, but simply make them understand what you were talking about. We have a way in debate of making it easier to form complete arguments. We use a structure called Claim Warrant Impact, or CWI. This isn't the only structure. There's plenty of other structures that people use for complete arguments in debate. And there's no rule in a formal debate that says you have to use claim warrant impact structure for writing your contentions or for making an argument. That said, what I found in my career as a coach and as a debater is that having this structure makes it so much easier to ensure that every argument you make is complete and to make sure that you're getting the maximum possible persuasive impact out of each one of your claims. So in order to explain how claim warrant impact arguments work and also why they're useful, we're gonna use a little bit of an example. I want you to use your imagination for the next part. And don't worry, it will connect to debate. All right, the scenario is there's a gold mine by a river. And the owner of the gold mine has hired you as an engineer to design some boats for transporting that gold. You see, the goal here is to get the gold onto a ship and it takes it down the river to the nearest town where you can deposit it in the bank. The gold isn't much use if you can't move it anywhere. But of course, not just any ship will do. Gold is a precious and difficult to transport commodity. You need to try and get it there safely. It's also important for the mine owner to make as much profit as possible. So the mine owner would appreciate it if you kept the boats as cheap as you possibly can. They also will make more profit if they can ship the gold to the bank faster. So it'd be nice for you to at least be efficient, if not speedy. Oh, and there's one more problem. On this river, all that gold attracts pirates. And those pirates are going to shoot at passing ships and try to sink them and then recover the cargo afterwards. So your, your boat also needs to be able to stand up to pirate attacks. But back to the scenario. I want you to pause the video and think about how you would design your ships. What would be the goals that you have to meet? What kind of strategies would respond to all of the different challenges presented by the scenario? Welcome back. So let's look at some ideas that might seem obvious at first, but they don't work. Each of these ideas does a really good job with one of the constraints of the scenario, but it messes up on another. You'll see. All right, so first of all, a very simple idea. What about a raft? It's cheap. You can get a whole bunch of gold on that flat surface. It's very easy to build a very large raft. And you can just load this thing down with gold. Look at that. All that space to put gold on. It's simple. 
It's easy. What's the problem? I think you're probably already imagining it, right? Gold is really heavy. And if you load down your raft, you're going to sink. And all that gold is going to be on the bottom of the river. So right away, we're noticing that this raft had a lot of cargo space, and it was very cheap. But it didn't have a strong enough foundation. The ship wasn't seaworthy enough. Its base wasn't strong enough to carry the load of all that gold. Okay, so you might be thinking, we could fix that problem by building a barge, right? So rafts are out. What about this freighter barge? It's big. It's designed for carrying heavy cargo. It can carry a whole bunch of gold. You can just load that down. But unlike the raft, it can actually bear that weight. It's got a really strong foundation, a really strong base. Perfect, right? Well, I'm guessing that you probably already spotted the problem with this one as well. This one's going to work just fine until the pirates come. Because this barge is very vulnerable to pirates. It will break apart. There's nothing protecting that gold. The pirates can shoot your ship to pieces or just shoot the gold. So we see the problem with this barge is it had a strong foundation and it had a lot of cargo space, but you really needed your ship to hold together when it's under pressure. And this barge can't do that. Now, I'm going to go to the option that I bet a lot of you went straight for. And that option is, what if we just made a ship that was impervious to the pirates? We don't want our ship to sink, right? We don't want our ship getting blown up. What if instead we just were able to build an armored ship, right? We'll put a bunch of armor on our ship and it will deflect the cannonballs. We will armor it up. Or... Or maybe we'll even put guns on our ship and we can shoot back at the pirates. Or maybe even we could build a submarine and sneak by the pirates so they can't even see us. These are very, these are very, very creative ideas. They're very good at fixing one problem, which is the pirates are not getting anywhere near your gold. So what's the problem with them? Yeah. Where are you going to put the gold? Building ships with armor is really expensive. Building a submarine, not only is that expensive, but there's not a lot of space inside. If you look at each of those ships, there's not a lot of space below decks to store that gold. And the ships are already so heavy with that armor, they can't take much more weight. Not to mention that building ships like this is very expensive. So, these ships are going to be great at getting the gold down the river, but once you get the gold safely to the town, there's not going to be enough of it to make a profit. So this design fails not because it's not safe enough, not because the base isn't strong enough, but because it doesn't have enough of a payoff. So overall, what do we need for a successful design in this scenario? We need balance. We need to make sure that our boat's not going to sink, that it can hold together when attacked, and that it will be carrying enough gold to make the trip worthwhile. So what does that have to do with the bait? Well, an argument has the same issues. An argument is like your boat. It carries the weight of your ideas along the flow of the debate. We actually use the word flow in debate to talk about note-taking and to talk about how we follow the different ideas as they develop in a round. So your argument, in order to work, it must make sense, which means it must have a solid basis. It needs to be able to stand up to criticism. It needs to hold together. And ultimately, it also needs to have enough value at the end of the debate to persuade a judge to vote for your side. So one way we do this is with a claim, warrant, 
impact argument. You need a solid basis for your argument. You need a warrant that shows that your argument will hold together even when it's challenged. And you need a strong impact so that if you can get your contention through the debate and convince the judge that it's true, well, you also need to convince the judge that it's enough to win you the debate. It needs to matter. Before we go more in depth on the different parts of a claim warrant impact argument, I want to remind everyone what we talked about in the last video. And those were resolutions. Resolutions are how we make the topic of a debate. So, for example, resolved. The voting age in the United States should be lowered to 14. That's a resolution. Resolved. Dogs are better pets than cats. Different resolution. Resolved. Homework should be banned. Remember, there are two teams in a typical debate. There's a pro team, a.k.a the affirmative or AF team, and they're trying to uphold the resolution. They're trying to support it. They're saying, yes, this resolution is true. It is good. You should vote for it. Then there's a con team. The con team is trying to negate. They're trying to oppose. They're trying to defeat the resolution. They say, this resolution is wrong. It's bad. Don't do this. Don't agree with it vote against the resolution. All right, back to arguments. Let's start with the claim. The claim, as you remember, is the framework, the foundation of your ship. It answers the question, what do you believe? So that means that it's a specific debatable statement of fact. You're saying, here is a thing that is true. It needs to be specific in that it needs to be, it can't just be a general statement. You need to be very clear about what you're claiming. And it needs to be debatable. There's no point in making a claim that everyone already agrees with. That's wasting your time. It needs to be a claim that you think you can back up and you think you can convince people is true, but not something that's really obvious. For example, for the first resolution, a claim could be a lower voting age lets teens get involved in the political process earlier. That, that's a potential claim. For the dog and cat resolution, you could claim dogs are more affectionate than cats. For the banning homework resolution, you could claim homework makes kids feel stressed out. So all of these are potential claims that are the start of an argument. This is the base that you're constructing the rest of your argument on top of, so it has to be solid. But it is not an entire argument by itself. Far too many people get stuck arguing their claim and supporting it with evidence and evidence and evidence and taking so much time establishing the claim that they never get around to explaining why we even care whether this claim is true or not. So just remember that. Oh, one more thing. Remember, your claim can always get better. So, part two, the warrant. This is where you start explaining why your claim matters. And this is the part of a claim warrant impact argument that is most commonly misunderstood. The warrant answers the question, how does that connect? And it includes a link to the topic at hand. So you're asking, how does this claim matter in the debate? How does it connect to the resolution we're talking about? What kind of impact might it have on the debate? You're, because the warrant is essentially linking the claim to the impact, which is the part that comes later. You need to prove that your claim is not just true, but also that it's relevant. I could get up there and claim that the sky is blue, but if you're here arguing about the voting age, 
you probably don't care very much. So for example, with that voting age claim, we could say that the reason it matters that teens can vote earlier is because if they get involved in the political process earlier, they're more likely to stay involved. You could claim that saying that dogs are more affectionate or more loyal than cats is important because loyalty is a wonderful quality in a pet. And you would go on and describe how important that is. You could do a warrant for the argument about homework stressing kids out by explaining that stress is harmful to kids in many ways. This is important. The warrant is not just evidence. A lot of people seem to have the idea that the warrant is evidence backing up your claim. That's not true, and that is not a good way to write debate cases. In a debate case, every part of your arguments should have evidence. The claim should have evidence. The warrant should have evidence. The impact should have evidence. You can't just have evidence for one part of your argument. The warrant is about linking the impact and the claim together and making it clear that this claim actually matters the way you say it matters. That is a very important distinction that you need to understand. So the warrant is setting up your impact. Usually, when you're writing contentions, it makes sense to write the impact before you write the warrant. It's very hard to write a warrant if you don't know what you're trying to link. And then, of course, the warrant is not enough by itself. And you might think, hey, dogs are more affectionate and loyal than cats. Loyalty is a wonderful quality. Isn't that complete? Well, no, it's not. Stress is harmful to kids. Homework causes stress. Isn't that complete? No. And actually, there's another issue with that warrant. Uh, it should be specific. If you really wanted a stronger argument, instead of saying, in many ways, I would just tell you the ways. I would have evidence that says childhood stress is linked to higher rates of, and then I would read the list of of diseases, and it would be based on research that I had done. And that long list of specific names of diseases, hopefully I would pick the most horrifying and scary diseases on the list, that would be much more convincing than just, oh, it's harmful in many ways. Anyways, we're going to move on to the impact. But remember, without the warrant, the claim and the impact don't connect which means that you might have a strong claim, you might have a strong impact, but without a warrant, how do you know that that impact is actually going to follow from that claim? We're going to see examples of this later. All right, the impact. This is the most important part of an argument, and this is the part that is most often left out by debaters who are inexperienced. It's also the part that is most often left out by non-debaters getting into arguments. The impact answers the question, so what? All right, you have a claim, you have a warrant, so what? Why do I care? Why does this matter to the debate? For example, by getting more people involved in politics earlier, we will improve the democratic process. This is going to cause higher voter turnout, which is already a major problem in the United States, where it's very difficult to get people to come out and vote. And more voter turnout will mean that the citizenry will make better choices in elected officials, leading to superior policy decisions, better laws, peace, prosperity, justice, etc. Of course, I would include evidence for that. I wouldn't just say it. I would make sure to back it up. Or, a loyal dog will help you, protect you, comfort you. If you have a dog, that dog can watch your door, can scare away robbers and attackers. That dog can come and help you feel better when you're sad. The dog 
understands your emotions and wants you to feel better. Having a cat, it won't do any of those things. A cat could just as easily ignore you when you're looking for comfort as it could help you. The cat is certainly not going to put itself in harm's way to protect you. Now, for cat people in the audience, I, I have three cats. I love cats. It's important as a debater to be able to attack positions that you love. And then, of course, with the stress, the connection could be by reducing stress, we can prevent those health issues. We can have healthier students who miss fewer days of school and grow up to be healthier adults. You could bring in ideas about how the United States healthcare system is overburdened and expensive, and we could save a lot of money and help the economy by reducing those stress-related disorders. You could explain how children with fewer stress with fewer stressors are going to be happier, and happier kids, happier people in general is generally a good thing. That is a thing that we should strive to do. So overall, when you are answering this question, so what, with your impact, you want to connect this claim to something that matters, something tangible. Can you save lives? Can you save money? Are you fulfilling somebody's values, values like justice or fairness or freedom? Um, you want to look at the weighing mechanism. Are you actually upholding that weighing mechanism? You want to support it with evidence. You can't just say having a dog will protect you. You need to actually prove that that's true. And even better, you need to explain how true that is. So even better than getting evidence that says sometimes dogs protect people, you could say, here's some evidence about how many people were protected by their dogs in the last year. You see, that way you're not just saying this is what matters, but also this is how much it matters. And of course, you want your impact to matter. You want your impact to be bigger or more likely to happen or to be longer term or to impact people who are more vulnerable or in any other way you want a better impact than the other team. Ultimately, when you get to the end of the debate, if you have been able to prove your claim and if you have been able to keep your warrant together, so that the judge accepts that your impact is real and is going to happen, or at least might happen, what's going to matter is the impacts that you won on, are they heavier than the impacts your opponents won on? If I can prove that my side of the resolution saves money, and you can prove that your side of the resolution saves lives, you're probably going to win because your impact matters more. Even though we both convinced the judge of at least one argument, your argument had more impact, and so you won. That's just like the cargo in that boat back in this scenario. If you have a really strong claim and an ironclad warrant, but your impact is really tiny and not very important, it's not going to help you win. Even if your opponent can't challenge it, it just isn't going to matter that much in the grand scheme of things. That's why the impact is the most important part of the contention, probably the part you want to write first. Let's look at an example of a claim warrant impact argument. Here's a, here's a resolution for you. Resolved. You should stick your finger in that power outlet. Don't do that because we're actually going to negate this resolution. I've, I've had enough examples of being pro and upholding the resolution. Let's negate this time. All right. Let's think of an argument for why you should not stick your finger in that power outlet. So here's a claim. Sticking your finger in there will really hurt. Right? That makes sense, right? Warrant. 
how do I know that it's going to really hurt? Well, there's a lot of electricity going through there. That's an okay warrant. We can do better, though. According to World Standards 2017, power outlets in the United States typically output 120 volts at a rate of 60 cycles per second. That is enough to do serious damage to a person. See, now I have a source, and I have a specific amount of electricity. Now, do I know what 120 volts at a rate of 60 cycles per second means? Well, I didn't before I did my research, but I have my source, and what I know is that's a lot of electricity. So don't get, don't get intimidated when you hear a debater quote a source that sounds really complicated. They probably had never heard of that source before starting their research. They became an expert on it in a couple weeks just because they had to in order to win this debate. All right, what about an impact? How about, according to Dr. Daniel P. Rund, writing for Merck Pharmaceuticals in 2017, touching an outlet can result in skin burns and or abnormal heart rhythms. Exposure to high voltage kills 400 people per year in the United States. Look at that. So that's a major impact right there. But it's not done. Because I've told you what the impact is, but I need to finish answering why it matters. The fact that it can burn you or mess up your heart rhythms or kill people means that sticking in your sticking your finger in that outlet could burn you, cause heart prob problems, or even kill you. And I know that you, like all people, should try to avoid pain, injury, and death for no reason. So that should there come straight out of the resolution. You see how I worked in that weighing mechanism? That's a pro tip. The solution is clear. Keep your finger out of that electrical socket. I rest my case. Now, you might have thought, oh, you know what? An easy impact would just be stick your finger in the socket. It's going to hurt. Pain is bad. Therefore, don't stick, it, stick your finger in. And that's a perfectly legitimate argument. But if I'm trying to really win this debate, I want to get the biggest impact I can. So in, in order to get a bigger impact, I did some research. And by finding this source, now instead of saying, oh, it's going to hurt, I'm saying, actually, you could die, right? Potential death is a much stronger impact than just a little bit of pain. Also, don't stick your finger in an electrical socket. You could die in real life. Don't do that. So, in summary, CWI arguments, claim warrant impact arguments. You have a claim, which is the basis for your argument. It's the thing you're sticking out there and saying, I'm going to prove this. This is true. Then you have your warrant, and your warrant is connecting that claim to your impact. So the warrant says, assuming that claim is true, here's how I'm going to make it relevant. Then you have the impact, which is saying, this is why it matters, and this is how much it matters. This is how my claim and my warrant can actually affect the outcome of this debate. Of course, you also need evidence for your claim. You need evidence that the claim is actually true. How do you know that that's actually true? Remember, claims should be debatable. If your claim is so obvious that you can prove it without evidence, then why is it your claim? Just back up a second and choose the next step in your argument. Your warrant. You need to explain how that link is real. Remember, I was able to cite world standards in order to show how an electrical socket actually has enough electricity to hurt someone. And then finally, you have your impact. You need evidence for two different things. First of all, how do you know that it will actually have this impact? I had that article from Merck Pharmaceuticals saying that 
it could cause burns, injury, or death. But it also said that 400 people a year die from sticking their finger in the socket. So that's giving me an idea of not just what is the problem with this resolution, but how big a problem is it. So that, that impact is going to need evidence to prove both how do you know the impact is real and also how do you know that the impact is as important as you say it is. Well. Now that you've learned a little bit about claim warrant impact arguments, what they are, how to make them, why they're valuable, it's time to put that idea into practice. The best way to do this is just to go back to arguments you've made in the past and try to rewrite them as claim warrant impact arguments. And you'll try to fill in the pieces you might have been missing. If you watched our second video, you already played the game Five Reasons Why. In this game, you had a resolution on the screen and you needed to think of five reasons in support of it. Well, this time, let's play three reasons why, but make each of those reasons a complete claim warrant impact argument. It's three reasons why because once you have to do CWI arguments, it's a lot harder to come up with them, so five might take a while. In case you don't remember what the resolutions were in the last video, I'm going to put them up on the screen in just a second. I wish you good luck with your three reasons why. I wish I could see what you come up with, but I guess I'm just going to have to wait until the next time I get to judge you in a debate round. And in the meantime, happy debating.